Yeah. And so I'd really like to address that question today. And so what I'm going to do is give you this paleoclimatic view of the future, and I'm going to ask the question, is the IPCC optimistic? Is that picture that people have in mind accurate? Is it never came off of negativity or trying to scare us, trying to get you out of stormtroopers into your gas station? Is it possible? Is it possible that, in fact, things are going to be a little more challenging in the future? Now, when I do this, please recognize that I'm not taking on the IPCC. In the book, thank you, Jim. Uh, in the book, you will find there's a couple paragraphs on the IPCC, and in particular, you will find the direct quote, I am favorably impressed with the IPCC process and product. I'm not taking on it. They did a good job. But they are the target. They are the picture that the world deals with when we look at climate change. And it's a reasonable question to ask. If it needs to be adjusted, which way should the adjustment be turned? So we will start off with some data. These are data I have not put out front here yet. This is from the Pacific Ice Core record from Central East. Those of you who wander in here from other sections of AGU, please note that paleoclimatologists usually run time backwards. So in point of fact, over on your right here is old and up to today here on your left. And most of these plots, not quite all, but most of these plots run time that way. This is 400,000 years ago, comes up to today. And if you focus first on the blue line, that is the temperature history from central Antarctica, it is a pretty good record. You can tweak the timing a little bit, you can tweak the temperatures a little bit, you can't go very far. This is good. Okay? What you'll see here is the ice age cycle. It was warm, it got cold, 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 it's warm and there we are. Okay? The basic ice age cycle, about 100,000 years between the warm peaks. We're reasonably confident that we know what's going on, sorry about that, with this ice age cycle. We're reasonably confident that it's linked to features of Earth's orbit. Little wiggles and wobbles and round and squashed and tipped and up and down and blah, 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 and so on. So we think we know what's going on with that, and people can write really good relations for that. If you were to take this record and do time series analysis on it, a whole lot of people have done that really sophisticated ways with SSAs and MEMs and so on. This is an FFT. This is real simple. If the Earth's orbits are ultimately forcing that curve, what you would expect is that there would be a peak on this plot right under that arrow. There would be a peak on this plot right under that arrow. And there would be peaks on this plot right under those two arrows. Okay, if you see peaks under those four arrows, then basically Earth's orbit is forcing the ice age cycle. It's pretty good. Okay, uh, these things work. There's something very interesting about that, though, which is that there's almost no net forcing involved. Very little change in the amount of sunshine that the Earth receives. All it is is a redistribution, north to south, summer to winter. And yet, basically, the whole world has an ice age together. And I'll show you that in a few ways. But basically, the whole world has an ice age together. It warms together despite not being in a global forces. And we'll show you that first here. This is the last 100,000 years. So 100,000 years ago up to today. The green record is from Greenland. That's a gift to ice ice topic record. Jim White from Pete Grote has worked on this one. There's a rough version. This is the raw data. And then there's a smooth version underneath it, if you like to look at smooth curves. Down below, the red curve there is the ice ice topic record from the Bird Station ice core in West Antarctica. Um, the timing of these two records is synchronized by Bolognier and Brooke is really good. There's really good dating on these. And what you can see in these records is the cooling into the ice age and the warming out of the ice age. And you can see that basically, north and south were doing the same thing at the same time. If you're really into details, you will notice that the north starts warming before the south does. But that difference is very small. And so basically, the whole world had an ice age together and the whole world got out of the ice age together. Now, this is related to sunshine and changes in sunshine. And so on top here, 90 north and 60 north, this is peak summer sunshine. This is midsummer sunshine. <laughs> and you'll notice that when Greenland was really cold, it wasn't getting much sunshine. When Greenland warmed, it was getting more sunshine. The rise in sunshine goes with warming. Hey, that makes sense. 
Life is good, we understand what's going on, and you'll notice that Antarctica, when Greenland is cold, Antarctica is cold, and Antarctica is getting the most sunshine. Give Antarctica the most sunshine, it gets coldest. When the sunshine goes away, Antarctica warms up. That's a little bit more problematic, and you'll see that pattern elsewhere. Lots of sunshine, warm in Greenland, warm in Antarctica, minimum sunshine in Antarctica. Most sunshine in the north is warm, least sunshine in the south is warm. Okay. What's going on? Well, we go back to the Vostok record, and lo and behold, there's an answer. That red curve on top. CO2 concentration obtained by breaking bubbles in the ice core, pulling it out, analyzing it. Beautiful record. Very nice, very, very reliable. It's been duplicated a lot of times in their work. They got good data. They, no problems with this one. Okay? When it's cold in Antarctica, CO2 is low. When it's warm in Antarctica, CO2 is high. Lots of things correlate. If you take a climate model and you tell that climate model about the orbits, you tell that climate model about the ice sheets, but you don't tell that climate model about the CO2. The climate model does a miserable, stinking job of simulating what happened. If you tell the climate model about the orbits and the ice sheets and the CO2, the model does a whole lot better. So it's not just a correlation. It's the only way that we can conceive of to explain why coldest when there's the most sun is that over big areas and long time, CO2 has a really important effect on temperature. Okay, so there's a place that we can start from. Now, what controlled the CO2? I'm not even going to put up my overhead. There was a whole session on that this morning, and um, we're not sure. But um, the, maybe some wind and some dust, and maybe a change in the pH of the ocean, and David Archer gave a great review of it. Um, whatever it was, northern sunshine somehow is affecting ice sheets, it's affecting CO2, and the CO2 is the global synchronizer. Now, with that as a global synchronizer, let's look a little bit. A lot of paleoclimatic work is, is sold on the argument that we're going to test our models. If you're a weather forecaster, you can predict the weather tomorrow, and you can find out tomorrow if you were right. If you're a climate forecaster, can you really wait 100 years for your first test? We're going to go to the past, and we're going to compare. So let's do this. There's this wonderful project, PMAP, Paleoclimate Model Intercomparison Project. There was a great summary from it, Harrison et al. in EOS this fall. This is a big one. It's got the right acronyms. It's got the right people looking over it. And it asks, the big models, the models that are being used to project our future, do they do the past well? And so let's take a look at that. The, the skinny version of it, when all is said and done, is that some of the models are pretty good and the others don't go far enough. And that's good at all the places and all the times that they've looked. So let's, let's take a look at it. This is a really ugly plot, and I've left it really small because it's useful. I don't want you comparing individual models. I want you to get the basic picture. These are different places. South America, external East Africa, South Africa, different places. Runs were made to ask how different the temperature was between the Ice Age and the day, how much warming from the Ice Age. Okay? And those runs were done by a whole bunch of different models. And they were done with two sets of oceans, one where they, the models were told what temperature to put in the ocean by climap, and those didn't work very well, and one where the models calculated the temperature in the ocean, and those are the ones we're going to look at. And so if we go to South America, for example, this model said there was that much warming from the Ice Age to today, and this model says there was a little more, and this model says there was a little less, and there's a whole bunch of estimates, and then there's a line across there, which is the average of all of these big models, how much warming they think happened from the Ice Age to today. If you draw that line across here, you come across the data plot, and you'll notice that the data, one of these points actually overlaps the average of the models. And all the rest of them say that the real world changed more than the models did. One of them overlaps with the average of the models. All the rest say that the real world changed more than the models did. If we go to Equatorial East Africa, a little more overlap, but the data say that the real world changed more than the models did. If we go to South Africa, the real world changed more than the models did. You just go right on down. There's a little bit of agreement with some data in New Guinea and so on. Basically, either the models are doing a good job. Not bad. If you like bashing models, I can get off of it because they're not bad. 
But if there's an error here, if there's a bias, this is consistently the real world changed more than the models did. That is true pretty much however you look. This is another PMET paper. Can you get Yama at all? This happens to be a look at sort of Western Eurasia, Central Eurasia, and Eastern Eurasia going from 30 degrees north to 60 degrees north. If we look first at the Western one up here, the warming from the Ice Age, the models say it's sort of those. Those are the lines, how much warming since the Ice Age. The data all say bigger changes in the model. Right across the board, those dots down here are what the data say. Actually, overlaps just a little bit on one point there and a little there. But they say bigger changes in the models do. Central Eurasia is closer. But the data still say bigger changes in the models. By the time we get out to, to Siberia, it's really pretty close. The models aren't bad. But the changes just seem to have been bigger than the models like. Okay, here's one more. This is one of those models. This is from Pollard and Thompson, um, GSR 97. Uh, this is from the Genesis model. And this is showing how much of the warming the model gets in different places, more or less from north to south. And there's a whole bunch of places here. And uh, here it gets three quarters, and here it gets two thirds. One of these, one of these sites, the model went farther than the data did. Here it gets half of it, here it gets a third, you know. On average, the model got two-thirds of what happened. So, if we take a quick summary, then, of what I've just done so far, I say cycles are global. They're broadly globally synchronous, despite hemispherically asynchronous forcing. Uh, their spacing matches features of Earth's orbit rather clearly. The orbits are in the game here. Um, they look like a northern sunshine signal, not a southern sunshine signal. And to make sense out of them, CO2 has got to bring more. If it doesn't, then we're lost. Um, if it does, it makes beautiful sense, except consistently, either the models that people are using to project our future are very accurate, or they underestimate the changes. Right across the board, they're either accurate or they underestimate the changes. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this could be. It's not a cold bias, it's not a warm bias. There's a sensitivity to change boundary conditions and how sensitive the model is when you change things. We could hope. Maybe it is that all of the errors in the model are in the snow and ice. And the future won't have much snow and ice, so the models won't make any errors in the future. We can hope. <laughs> the least astonishing hypothesis that I get from this is that either the future warming projections are accurate or they have underestimated what we face in the future. I think this is a hypothesis that deserves really serious consideration. Um, I think you can see the need for more of this work, more data models, model comparisons. I haven't shown you ocean ones yet. We need ocean comparisons. We need warm time comparisons. There's a lot of really fine work to be done here to test this hypothesis. But right now, the hypothesis says don't look at the low side of the warming. The models are undersensitive compared to the world, apparently, or they're accurate, and so things will tend to be on the high side. That's a hypothesis that I draw out of what we can see in the past. Okay, so that's a warm-up. Now let's get serious here. This is actually one that I had a little bit to do with. There's a couple of records on here. These are from central Greenland, 10,000 years ago up to today. This is a snowfall record and a temperature record. And a whole bunch of really good people put these together. And um, you will see the broad arch here, temperature in central Greenland, is the orbital signal. The changes in, in sunshine in the north. And then I focused on a couple of little wiggles over here. That little wiggle right there and the little cooling down there, a couple degrees. A whole lot of records from around the North Atlantic look like that. These are records strictly from Central Greenland, but a lot of records around the North Atlantic look like that. This little high spot right here is called the medieval warm period. That's the time that the Vikings settled in Iceland, the time that they settled in Greenland, the time they explored the new world. Um, there were people there who did not wish to be settled, so they traded with them instead. Um, and then it, it was a good time to be zipping around the North Atlantic, because you didn't run into many icebergs. You could take a European farming economy and transplant it into Greenland, call Greenland Greenland, and get by with it. Uh, great advertising campaign. They knew what they were doing. Uh, okay, and then there's the cooling. 
and work by Jim White, Lisa Barlow, and the top of government and others. Right there, this was smooth curve, but that little wiggle right there is when the Vikings settlement in West Greenland failed. They, they had been bringing the animals into houses and they finally ate their dogs and they quit. And we don't know what happened, but they, they're gone, okay? And, you know, Bruegel the Elder is painting those beautiful paintings of the glaciers rumbling down out of the Alps and Hans Breaker is skating around on the canals of Holland and so on. So this is the Little Ice Age. <laughs> and, um, that is the scale of climate change. It doesn't control humans, but it affects humans very clearly. Now, a whole lot of you know what I'm doing to you here. Um, this is climate change as she happens. Exactly the same plot, exactly the same scale. This is what did in the Vikings in Greenland right there, and this is what they can do. If you don't take anything else away, if you haven't seen this plot yet, just take this plot. Okay, just put that thing in your head and say, you know, it can do something that's fairly interesting. <laughs> the younger try is here. This pattern, and we're going to see this pattern again, I'm going to simplify it. The ice age, it ends, it staggers back, and it ends again, and then up to today. So this, this oscillation, the, the onset of the bowling and the return of the cold of the younger dryas, is the ice age, it ends, it staggers back, and it ends again. The change in central Greenland, the age Celsius, uh, order of 10 years, uh, twofold in snowfall, order of three years. Um, so it was a pretty big change, and it was a pretty fast change. It is not just Greenland. That's the next thing to take home. Here is the same curve. The ice age, it ends, it staggers back and it ends again in snowfall and, and temperature. And I scrunch them down so it doesn't look very scary, so I can put a lot of curves on the plot. Okay? This one in red is sea salt. The one in blue is calcium, Paul Majewski's lab. And the sea salt is, is windblown. It's not Greenland. Greenland's got ice on it. So, and what you find is that there's a lot of sea salt when it's cold and dry in Greenland. There's very little being blown up when it's warm and wet in Greenland, and the sea salt comes back when it cools again. The dust, Jervis K and co-workers have fingerprinted the isotopes, the, the mineralogy, the chemistry of the dust. This is coming from Asia. It's coming up over the top. Okay? Changes of one to two orders of magnitude in dust concentration. Beautifully linked. When Greenland is cold and dry, there's a lot of dust blowing over from Asia. This is not just Greenland. This one's methane. Brooke and the seven houses, Soares and Bender on this side of the Atlantic, and a distinguished team, you know, Chapalaz and, and um, a whole bunch of distinguished people on the other side of the Atlantic, and you get the same answer. When Greenland is cold, methane is up. When Greenland warms, methane goes up about 50%. The change is just a little bit after the temperature rise. Methane is not forcing the warming, it's a tracer of what's going on. There still is a nagging worry about clath rates, but one can say that the tropics were involved in this by comparing interhemispheric gradients between Greenland and Antarctica. The tropics are involved. And it's pretty clear it's tropical wetlands, there's a lot of it. And so when Greenland warms up, the tropical wetlands get wet. When Greenland gets cold, the tropical wetlands dry out. This top curve I'm going to blow up for you in the next one. This is Huygen et al. Beautiful record. A bunch of very good people put this together. Here's the Greenland record in green. The ice age it ends and staggers back and it ends again. This is a record of the color of a sediment core from offshore Venezuela. And if you wander through all the complexities of what that is saying, when all is said and done, and you look at a little column, when all is said and done, when Greenland is cold, dry, and windy, so is Venezuela. These are completely independently developed. They are completely independently dating. The only thing I have done to cheat here is to draw little lines that are supposed to draw your eye between them. It's the same record. Change in Venezuela is about 10 years. It's not just Greenland. This is most of the world. Okay? The Ice Age, it ends, it staggers back, and it ends again. The Vikings lose right there. The long record is a very interesting thing to look at. And it actually is a little bit suggestive that we may not have in mind quite the right picture of the variability of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and these are not just Greenland. Pretty much everything marches together on these. Now, Peter Clark and co-workers have put together a whole bunch of records that were really well sampled, really high resolution, really well painted, and they looked at the deglaciation of these. And they asked, 
what do they show? And the top one here is the first EOF of all those things. They show the ice age. There's one funky red dot up there, which is carbon concentration in the sediment core. But basically what this top panel shows with all these blue dots and the big numbers next to them is that the whole world had an ice age together. Despite the sunshine being out of phase north and south, the whole world had an ice age together. The bottom one shows that the whole world basically is seeing these large, abrupt changes that are on the flanks of the Ice Age, the staggering going into and out of the Ice Age. It shows that most of the world looks like Greenland. Cold, dry, and windy, sort of an Ice Age signal running together. And it also shows, with one exception, that the South Atlantic and the Antarctic looks like anti-Greenland. There's a little bit of a seesaw here. Most of the world sees these abrupt changes, most of the world looks like Greenland, but the South Atlantic and most of the Antarctic looks like anti-Greenland. Cold when Greenland is warm, or warm when Greenland is cold. So there's a couple things going on here. There's a global ice age, which is orbits of CO2, and there's a millennial seesaw, which I'm going to try to convince you now is ocean circulation. So, we'll try it this way. 40,000 years ago to today, this is Greenland. The um, sort of hard to see purple arrows down here, this one and this one and this one and this one, mark very cold times. When the cold extended well out from Greenland, these are very marked cold periods. And they also mark the times when there were big surges of icebergs out of Hudson Bay. Dr. McHale, who's over here, has modeled the, the reasons why this happened. But the big ice sheet got big and then it dumped. And in dumping, it fresh into the North Atlantic with tremendous pulses of icebergs, and then there was this really big, long cold time. Now, they don't look as special in the Greenland plot, but if you look at plots from elsewhere, the world noticed that there were icebergs in the North Atlantic. This cooling right there came immediately after a great big outburst flood from a lake that was sitting around the ice in North America. There's a wonderful little wiggle right there, the pre-boreal reversal, that came immediately after another outburst flood of a lake that was sitting in North America. And we're going to come back to this sucker right there. The smoothing makes this look a little less than it was, but that one comes immediately after an outburst flood. Peter Clark, who's over here, has documented some of these other wiggles being related to the routing of meltwater to the North Atlantic. So there's a whole bunch of places that cold in the North Atlantic goes with fresh air. You freshen it, and immediately after, it gets cold. Okay, well, what's going on? All right, this is a current map, uh, Tolmaza, and then I just took it out of the shadow and work. It goes to 60 south, it goes above 60 north. All the waters that are near the Antarctic are cold. You can't get warm water across because it gets turned by Coriolis. The only place that warm water gets near the pole in the world ocean is right up here in the North Atlantic. The only place that warm water gets near the pole is right up there. It's doing it because it's dense up there. So this is the, another Pachetto and Hort plot. And I just covered in everything, colored in everything that's really dense in surface waters. The dense waters around Antarctica are cold. The dense waters in the north are actually fairly warm. They come trucking along. They come across the equator. And they come trucking up here. They're probably they're salty, in part because the trade winds blow moisture across Panama. But they're really salty. And when you try to cool salty water, it gets really dense. And when it gets really dense, it sinks. Now, because some of that is caused by saltiness, if you freshen it, it gets harder to sink. And so that brings us to um, the Great Khartoum. The Great okay, this is, um, you've probably seen this before. This is my Wally Broker model physical oceanography detector. If the person sitting next to you grimaced, that person is a physical oceanographer or has latent tendencies. <laughs> You should keep an eye on them. <laughs> uh, yeah, the world is a lot more complicated than this, which is a tremendously powerful metaphor for what's going on. The water comes up here, the sunlight shines on it, and the energy from that sunlight warms it up, and that heat ends up in the atmosphere up here. There's a theft of heat from the south that's taken to the north. That warm, salty water comes up here, and it cools, and then it sinks. And in so doing, more warm, salty water comes up, and you can't get sea ice in the system can't grow ice on top. Well, people in San Francisco don't know anything about this, but the people who live in the east know that if you're in Buffalo and the Great Lakes are open in the winter, 
that it isn't terribly cold, but man, you get dumped on with a lot of snow. When the Great Lakes freeze, boom. It's really cold and it's really dry. Well, this is, somebody once said the study of North, the North Atlantic Ocean is limnology, but at any rate, here's a great big lake. <laughs> um, and if you freeze this great big lake, or even a part of it in the winter, a lot of people are going to notice it. And if you freshen it, it'll freeze before it sinks. And so that's the basic picture. And the data say, freshening cold, freshening cold, freshening cold, freshening cold, freshening cold. Freshening. There's a lot of these. It starts to get to you that maybe something's going on here. <laughs> now, if you make it cold up there, people in Northern Europe probably notice, and they might not be happy about it. What is surprising is that a whole lot of other people apparently would have noticed. And this is a wonderful record of the isotopic composition of a cave formation from Hulu Cave in China, Wang et al., um, compared to the Greenland record, and we're looking from 70,000 years ago up to 10,000 years ago. Our cycle, the ice age, it ends and it staggers back and it ends again in green for Greenland, in black for China. It is reasonably clear that this is a measure of the strength of the monsoon. When Greenland was cold, the monsoon was reduced or failed. And when Greenland warmed, the monsoon came back. It's a long way from the North Atlantic to get to China. And if you do this right, and the people who have studied this have done it right, you sort of see a big one here and a big one here and these three and these three and a couple there and a couple there. All the events are there. It's not exactly the same shape. It's not quite as similar as some of the curves, but all the events are there. And so, when Greenland was cold, the monsoon was unhappy. We've tried to simulate this. A lot of people have. People make the North Atlantic cold, and this is one that Peter Fuss and Henri Augustin had. We make the North Atlantic cold in a climate model and ask what happened. This particular one is a, is a question about where did it get drier if you make the North Atlantic cold. And um, it does a lot of things right. We know that the lakes tended to dry up around the Sahara, and it makes around the Sahara dry. Uh, we know that it got dry in Venezuela, and the model makes Venezuela dry. It doesn't do very well over in China, to be honest. It does not much there, and it doesn't do very well out in the Great Plains with the U.S., where it looks like it got dry. Um, and we've done this, and other people have done this, and I'm not going to show many plots, but the skinny version is, if you go in a model, you make the North Atlantic cold, the model then matches a lot of things that happen. Changes in seasonality and snowfall in Greenland and how they affect the ice topic ratio of snow. Um, changes in the, the Eklund convergence off of Venezuela and how that affects the, uplift, the upwelling and the nourishment of the bugs. The model does a lot of things right, but it just doesn't go far enough. It doesn't make as big a change as nature seems to have. We'll show one more event, I promise you this one. The ice age it ends, it comes back and it ends again. It's just off the edge here. This is the Holocene in Greenland, the current warm period. And I want to focus on this little thing. Right there, there's a big outburst flood. Gary Clark has calculated a year, a half a year, six to 13 spare drops for people who are into spare drops. Big flood. Big fresh make of the North Atlantic. And then Greenland cooled six degrees or so. Decades down, 100 years or so, something like that. Um, it got dry, the accumulation dropped. I turned a couple of curves upside down here. So there was more windblown dust and more windblown sea salt. Ken Taylor's great record of the fallout of forest fire smoke. There were more forest fires upwind of Greenland during this time, dropping forest fire smoke in. And this beautiful record of methane from the two ice cores in central Greenland at the summit um, with a methane drop. Okay, the world noticed. Big fresh event, boom, fresh water out in a warm time, in a time warmer than recently, and you drop six degrees Celsius and you start burning in other places and you get a signal. Okay? And if you then go and ask, with, uh, what else do you find in terms of climate records? What you find is the lakes were drying up in Africa and the, the monsoon looked like it was in trouble and it was cold in a lot of places and that's sort of the geographic pattern of this. This is a time of freshening in the North Atlantic from a condition a little bit warmer than today, and that's the basic anomaly pattern that pops out. <coughs> so, abrupt climate changes. They've been real, don't doubt this. They've been big, third to a half of the glacial and glacial amplitude in something like 10 years. Widespread, repeated. 
Um, they are not restricted to cold times. They're dominantly a cold time event. But they're clearly not restricted to it. Okay. Often, immediately, you get cooling after an Earth Atlantic freshening. You simulate many aspects well by models forced with Earth Atlantic freshening. But in general, again, the models tend to underestimate the size and the, the extent of these sorts of events. Okay, what does that mean, anything? You remember this plot. Um, CO2 was changing, and so we have this deglaciation with CO2 rising. The last time that CO2 rose fairly rapidly, Here's the CO2 coming up from 20,000 to 10,000 years ago. Here's the ice age it ends, it staggers back, and it ends again. The last time CO2 rose really rapidly is when we had a really big problem in events. There's several possible interpretations. Maybe when you're just halfway in between, it wobbles back and forth. Maybe the climate system is a drunken student. If you leave it alone, it just sits there, and when you force it to move, it staggers. <laughs> question, which is right, because we're going to force it to move. This is our same original plot, and we scale to show you where we will go off the top of that plot in the next century if we keep doing what we're doing now. And so this is the same ice age cycle, the same CO2 forcing, and there's where we're headed. And so that's worth thinking about. Lots of people have thought of that. Lots of people have modeled it. Most everybody's model freshens, except one exception that I know of, most everybody's model freshens the North Atlantic in the future. They don't do terribly scary things, by and large, although they don't do terribly scary things in the past when we know scary things happen, so I don't know if that's reassuring or not. Um, this one is one that I pulled off the, the GIFs website, and that's a GIFs. It um, was done for the IPCC. They ramped up CO2 into the future at 1% increase per year, and they looked 70 years into the future. Um, the world's warm. Green is no change. Yellow is a degree, and dark red is 6 degrees warming. And in this particular model, um, you get four degree of mean annual cooling, probably mostly in the winter, in the North Atlantic here, and some interesting things around Antarctica. So global warming makes it a little bit chilly in places, which is an interesting outcome. What that does to, to drought is anybody's guess, but uh, it's a good one. So, we come back to this future. This is, the IPCC knows this. They got smart people. They talk about abrupt climate change, but eventually you have to pull this down to the point that you can give it to a policymaker and say, here is the skinny version. And the skinny version often looks like this. Warming, sea level rise into the future. Time's not going to your right. But warming and sea level rise into the future with a lot of uncertainty based on uncertainty in the models and based on uncertainty in what we humans do. But you know, it always looks smooth. It always looks smooth. Well, if there's one thing we know is that it wasn't smooth in the past. And so I was fortunate enough to be associated with this NRC report about climate change. Um, and I learned a lot from this. Um, it was really good people. It was an international panel. We went from um, paleoclimatologists to, to physical oceanographers to um, economists. Um, so we, we had the gamut in here. And I can say it was really good, and I learned a whole lot. What that report says, when all is said and done, if you want the skinny version, it's that the Earth's climate system has switches as well as tides. And the record is very clear on this. You can get models to do this. It makes sense, OK? You flip a switch, it can cause a faster change, a bigger change than turning a dial. It's harder to deal with changes that are faster. Um, it's harder to predict them. I'm sitting there and just leaning on the light switch. When in detail is it going to switch over is not always easy to tell. It isn't clear that we know where every switch is in this particular climate system, and so it is likely that the system will surprise you someday. Now, we tried to address causes of rough climate change. We said, okay, we're not even going to consider the, the case of blowing up all the bombs on Earth. That could do it, but it's a different research agenda. Uh, <laughs> And so what we were concerned with was forcing across a threshold, and whether forcing across a threshold could trigger abrupt climate change. And the analogy we draw here is of standing in a dark room, knowing that somewhere in the room there's a stairway that you could fall down. Now, if you knew exactly where it was, and you turn around and walk the other way, you would be coming safer. But if you don't know where it is, and you just stagger around blindly in the dark, you're more likely to fall down the stairs than if you stand still. And so until we know where the thresholds are, you, you sort of get to the point of saying, well, human 
forcing is increasing the likelihood of abrupt climate change. Not because there's anything worse about humans and nature, but just because we're staggering around them. We're not sure where the stairways are at this point. Okay? So we said, what should we do about this? Give us more money and we'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> but we also said, you know something? We better get some money to our friends. And if we don't have the rest, best friends, we should go make them. Because very clearly, this feeds into ecology. Very clearly, this feeds into economics. Very clearly, this has a research agenda that goes beyond physical climatology, beyond paleoclimate. Yes, we need an ice core in West Antarctica. But we also need to understand resiliency. We need to understand adaptability because it is likely that we're going to have some that we can put constraints on what's possible. We can improve advice to policymakers a lot. But are we ever going to be able to say that on April 23rd in 2023 that the thermohaline circulation will shut down? Probably not. And so then you get to the point of asking, how do we, how do we deal with that uncertainty? Let me put up one more paleoclimate record here. This is another one I had nothing to do with whatsoever, except that Overpeck told me that I should go try this website, so I did. This is Laird et al.'s record of salinity of a lake in North Dakota. Time is now again running from old to today. This is 2,000 years ago coming up to today. And this is how, so basically up is wet and down is dry. And you'll remember that back in the 1930s, there was a, a little perturbation out in the Great Plains. It extended well up into North Dakota. North Dakota had a big dust bowl signature, and it made good folk music, and it made bad life. And um, <laughs> there it is, right there. So there's the dust bowl. And I don't know exactly what to do with that plot, but it's one of those that makes you think. And I'm sure Albert Beck can tell us what to do with it. But at any rate, that makes you think. And so that, that brings me to Tina Holba's victim, which she got from a NASA Goddard memo a while back about electrical problems. But what Tina <laughs> passed along on her website is prepare immediately for whatever is going to happen next. Okay, maybe something there. So. Is the IPCC overly optimistic? I hope not. I don't like where this is leading me for the future. We're not sure. We absolutely are not sure. But we can make some hypotheses. And they're hypotheses that are going to drive my research. And I hope they're going to drive some of your research as we roll along here. When we look at climate model sensitivity, the major climate models, the ones that are driving the IPCC, either are pretty good on past changes, and they are. They're not as model bashers like the bash models. The models are really pretty good. But they tend to be less sensitive than the world. Um, and that's true for glacial interglacial. It's true, true for abrupt climate changes. It's true for the monsoon and the mid Holocene and so on. Um, and of the many possible explanations, I think it's really important that we find out whether they really are less sensitive than the Earth system is. In addition, because faster and less expected changes are harder to handle, this tendency of the policymaker to see a smooth curve has to be really disturbing. Because whatever it's going to do, if it's smooth, we're going to be really surprised. It's going to stagger, it's going to jump. What happens regionally is not going to happen globally. And we really, I think, need to look at how variable will it be, what's possible in the system, and where does it go? And so I don't know if the IPCC is overly optimistic, but I think we've got a real research agenda to have a look at it. And right now, it doesn't look like they're terrible pessimists, at least. All right, thank you for your attention. that you sit tight for a couple of minutes while Betty makes a presentation to Richard. So, questions? Uh, yeah. 
Okay, triggers in the past were outburst floods, were there others? Um, there's a real question, how fast do you have to fresh in the North Atlantic to make a big difference? And so we need to think about that. But for the global ones right now, I think the ones that we have have strong hypotheses for in the North Atlantic, I'm equally positive that if we were to go around the room and say, okay, are you sure that it's the North Atlantic? Could it have been changes in El Nino and the tropics? That there's a lot of people who would say, hey, wait a minute, I've got a trigger in my world. So yeah, I think that there's other triggers. And then when you go to the regional scale and you ask what was happening on my continent when this drought hit, I'm sure that you'll find a lot of very strong feedbacks and a lot of triggering things and that they will look like and so they will look maybe like NAOAO or AAO um, or one of the other uh, alphabet soups. So I'm reasonably confident that while I focused on the one that I sort of know best because it's sitting right next to Greenland, I'm reasonably confident that if you had gotten a tropical researcher to give this talk, that you'd have gotten the same answer that I've got up here right now. We'd better look real carefully. But you'd have probably gotten a very different focus on traders and sensitivity. So I'm reasonably confident that you could give the same talk with completely different examples and get to the same conclusion as up here, which is we better know what we're doing. Um, is it very well dated? Hulu Cave is very well dated in the so people did a good job. Uh, it's a first rate plan. Um, I don't think you can do leaps and lags because, if for no other reason, that I don't think we're quite that good at this. And we're going to have to go back and do that. In terms of doing leaps and lags, absolute dating is still. You know, when you get down to is it 10 years or 20 years, absolute dating is still hard, and you still want to go look for those timelines. And so I don't, I don't know at this point whether we can do leads and lags. I'm not confident. Why are the northern southern hemispheres out of phase? Best picture is this seesaw of the, the ocean heat transport. So the sunshine today that shines in the South Atlantic. The energy from that, some of it gets into the atmosphere in the North Atlantic. If you stop the sinking in the North Atlantic, you presumably stop some of that cross equatorial flow, so you leave the heat in the South. And so, presumably, the whole world up and down in the Ice Age is orbits in CO2, and the whole world like this is most easily explained by ocean circulation. I think that when all is said and done, then we'll find that it's, it's Dr. and Broker and it's ocean to travel in ocean circulation. Yes? Do you think that flying Antarctica is truly today? I'm sorry? Do you think that the uh, ocean transport we saw is why Antarctica? Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So there's this observation of little warming in the continent of Antarctica with a lot of warming in the, the you know, the sub Antarctic and up in the Antarctic Peninsula. And what's going on there? Um, I'm out of my depth. Um, my suspicion is that a lot of that is going to turn out to be, um, somehow it's going to turn out to be the ozone probably. That you, you change, you're making really cold air a lot. When you don't have ozone out there, you're spinning up the, the Antarctic, um, you know, the flow around Antarctica, and you're sort of isolating the continent from what's around it with big warming in the sub-Antarctic and not in the Antarctic. Whether you can see anything of a seesaw through that, it's possible. I don't think we can say yet. I think that's one of those really interesting questions. If anyone wants to comment, I take it. But yeah. <laughs> Okay, so as you went, the, the argument here was that the intensity of staggering is smaller when it's warm, and certainly that's what it looks like. The question is, what about really warm? If it's really warm, we don't have ice, so you've got to ask somebody else. 
<laughs> I, I think that's one of those really interesting questions, and I think that's one we have to, to go after hard. Right now, if you're a if you're a high latitude person, the, the Holocene clearly is variable, but it clearly looks less variable than, than the warm times, uh, than the cold times. If you were somebody who worked on moisture availability of the land surface in warm places, they tend to get a little upset at the boring Holocene picture. Because if you go and ask how is moisture buried on land surfaces over the time that we can get records, there's a whole lot of variability in warm places. <clears throat> and so there, there's some bias in the record that you're using, but if you go to the tropics, you will see maybe the difference in variability between warm and cold is going to be a lot smaller than it is in the high latitude records or these sort of global records that we're dealing with. So um, it's harder to get good records in the tropics. Let's face it, the tropics, you get good records in the poles because the Earth system is not as good at recycling. And so you get this pile of crud that's left there. And the, the tropics tend to recycle. And so it, this, this greatly motivates the need for harder work in the tropics as well as in the poles. Because those records are so important and they're so hard to get. Yes? What is it about CO2 that causes the change to be global? What is it about the CO2 causing the change to be global? As far as I can tell, the CO2 is global. Um, CO2 is a good radiative forcer, and it's one that gets to the whole world. Um, now, why the CO2 change? That, that's David Archer's game, but uh, <laughs> it's more like some bunch of others. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the, the argument was if you want to want to look at the history of policy making, often we don't do anything until something dramatic happens, something kicks us in the butt, and then we notice it. Uh, and so the question is, is this is this the thing that's going to kick us in the butt and um, and get us to do something? I hope that we do something before it kicks us in the butt. <laughs> I mean that would that would be the goal. Is that, that, um, we should look at these things. There surely are some model results that indicate that even slowing down will stabilize the thermohaline circulation. So, so Stockers model, if you run it into the future with a large or a rapid rise in CO2, the thermohaline circulation is in trouble. If you, you slow it down a little bit, the thermohaline circulation can handle it. So slowing down may help. And then looking for resiliency. You know, saying, look, we will see changes. And you know this, we know this, we will see changes. When the, when the little ice age came on in Greenland, there were two groups of people living next to each other. And one group bent, and the other group broke. And it wasn't climate didn't control them. One group came right on through, and the other group didn't make it. And so when all of said and done, we want to be the ones that bend not the ones that break, and we really ought to figure out how you bend. And we should be ready to bend when the time comes. What are you going to do with your first person's advice? Okay, I'm president. Okay, advice on policy. <laughs> economics, you'd laugh at me, okay? So, um, I'd be very skeptical. Um, my suspicion is that CO2 sequestration is probably a very good idea, but my suspicion is that anything that involves us passing laws to say there's a really nice stuff in the ground that's going to let you have air conditioners and cars and CD players, don't burn it, it's going to be really hard by law to convince people not to burn their fossil fuels until you've got a better alternative. And that better alternative could go in a lot of ways, and it could be nuclear, and it could be conservation is a big chunk of it. But you know, if you could plug your house into your shingles and run your CD players, you wouldn't want to bring gas in. And so if I were president for a day, I'd probably put some money in solar. Um, because I think we're going to need technical help to do this. Just simply telling people, no, 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 don't use it. It's not nice. It's hard, it's hard to do that. Um, and then beyond that, 
I think that we really do have to, to get better ideas of what's possible. We do. We, we get serious about looking at, at finding these other triggers and understanding the tropics and understanding the thermohaline circulation. I drove another ice core in Antarctica. And um, <laughs> so we get serious about figuring this out, and then we get serious about figuring out how do we fit. What are the things that you do now that don't cost that much that allow you to go through smoothly? You know, if you're if you're almost out of water, if you're using every drop of water and nature takes some water away, you're going to be in court until hell freezes over. Maybe you figure out a way not to go into court when the water supply changes, so that you're you're using your money to to get new sources of water as opposed to suing each other about it. And so that that would be what I look at. The carbon dioxide concentration change abruptly, naturally, not very much. Um, there's this wonderful new Mona et al. record that shows a little step that's probably what solubility or something, but the abrupt changes that we've seen naturally, or the changes in carbon dioxide that we see naturally don't look as big and as fast as what we humans are doing. Our forcing now is out of the range, so like Dominique made the point in the, in the earlier session, is that our forcing now is out of the range of what's natural. Before we thank Richard again, um, um, I'd like to, I'm Betty Otto Pleasner, I chair the Paleo Oceanography and Paleo Climatology Focus Group, and uh, on behalf of the committee and AGU and all of you, I'd like to thank Richard uh, for a very stimulating uh, fourth Emiliani lecture and present him this certificate. <laughs> Immediately following this in room 132 in the Scobie Center. So thanks again, Richard.